we clearly decided recently in our own minds what role Braniff had to play and what niche in the market we could perform in successfully. And this statement of purpose that is up here says it as succinctly as we possibly can. Become a low-cost, low-fare specialty carrier that results in profitability and quality of service leadership. This statement of purpose will be further elaborated on within the next few weeks as we communicate what our philosophy of management will be and what our operating strategy will be and what your role and my role will be from here on. Phil Guthrie and I learned at Southwest Airlines when we first arrived there that the purpose and the niche of Southwest had not been clearly defined to the employees or to the lenders or to the investors. So we finally ended up by saying to people that Southwest was not an airline. And the only commonality between it and other airlines was the fact that we had airplanes. Beyond that, Southwest was in a totally different kind of business. Well, the same is true here at Braniff. Braniff is not a trunk airline. I repeat, Braniff is not and cannot be a trunk airline. We are a specialty carrier that has efficient, modern, 146-seat, spacious 727-200s, 62 of them. And it is with this asset that we are building the framework for the new Braniff going to be a much different Braniff than many of you are used to, much different than many of our customers are used to, but it's a necessity. Now, let's go take a look at some of the advanced bookings and the initial results of Texas class. And before I discuss the chart, let me just say thank you to all of you for the outstanding job you and your people did over the Thanksgiving holiday. From November 20th to the 25th, Braniff had a 68% load factor. We carried 21% more passengers than we would have carried had we not had the simple unrestricted low fares. And by the way, these are not discount fares. This is going to be our standard basic fare. And in our niche of the market, low fares will become a way of life and not just a weekend fling. During that same period, our good friends down the road American only had a 63% load factor. What a shame. Now look at the slide. On November 4th, our Thanksgiving bookings for 1981 on that day were only 76.5% of the previous year for that same period. And our Christmas bookings were barely 70% of what they had been in 1980, meaning we were 30% below 1980 Christmas bookings. And you can see the similar trend for December and for New Year's. And as we get closer to that February 1 date, and then you see that January was only 67% of a year ago. Well, the results from Thanksgiving came in at 102% of 1980. We carried 2% more passengers than we did in 1980, even though we started out much further behind. The month of November in total came in at only 85.5% of 1980. But remember the Texas class fares did not start until the 24th of November. Now, if you look at our most recent review of our reservations inventory, you can see that our December 9 advanced bookings for Christmas are now 8% higher than they were for 1980. Same is true for New Year's, and even January is improving, up to 90% of a year ago. But beyond February 1, the advanced bookings are not as encouraging yet. And that's why we're pushing and pushing with the lenders. Now, this advanced booking chart gives you an even more dramatic look at the impact of the Texas class fares. From August 26th down through the 4th of November, you can see that we were running along on an almost consistent booking pattern. We really weren't gaining anywhere from a year ago. And these numbers are expressed as a percent of the prior year's advanced bookings and on that date, and they extend into the future for 340 days from that point in time. So on November 4th, we only had 71% as many advanced bookings in our inventory for the next 340 days as we had a year ago. But if you look at December 9th, I, I meant to say look at November 4th when we had only 71%, but if you look at December 9th, you'll see a dramatic increase. And we are now up to 83% of last year's inventory going out 340 days. That's more than an increase of over 200,000 bookings. 
Now, I'd like to discuss a little bit with you as to what our operating strategy is going to be and what the plan for 82 is going to be. We have done a lot of research, you've done it before I got here, into our markets and to see who our travelers are. And your travelers here at Braniff are no different than what we've experienced in other places. Fortunately, we are situated in a growth part of the United States with a lot of our operation in this part of the country. In the Sun Belt, we're fortunate to have many routes that because of energy and climate, etc., have caused business travel to grow disproportionately to the rest of the country. And although a few select people are allowed to fly first class, mainly employees heretofore, 96% of our customers have been flying in the main cabin of our 727-200s. The Air Transport Association has stated that 3% of all the travelers make 31% of all the trips. So the business traveler, he and she, are the guts of Brannis business. They're demanding, they like friendly employees, they like some amenities, they like leg room, they like frequency of service, dependable schedules, and they and their companies like low fares. Some travelers fly with us in a different role as vacationers or on personal emergencies. And they're also very loyal to the airline who is a leader and introduces innovations from which they benefit and they will support you. Now, service levels. Simplicity can help considerably in improving your service levels and your productivity. And because of only 15 fares, our length of calls and reservations have already dropped on the average from 3 minutes and 10 seconds down to 2 minutes and 35 seconds. That's a 20% redu reduction. That's productivity. Our check-in times at the airports is starting to, look, to move a little more rapidly. Not fast enough to suit me, but I hope you will keep working to try to simplify that process even more so that the seat selection, which the people love, the customers love, can be made even easier. Seat selection in advance seems to be an important benefit to our customers, and we've got to find ways to help that be done through travel agents in advance of getting to the airport. Once you get on the airplane, we've tried to simplify services by eliminating the duplicate inventories of the food, dishes, glasses, etc. And now our flight attendants can spend more time concentrating their energies in serving one class versus two. We also plan to enhance quality, not decrease it. Improve schedule connections and passenger flows. Presently at DFW, 40% of all the flights terminate there. The crews get off, the airplanes have to be cleaned, restarted, completely unloaded, and then go again. That's not very efficient. By February 1, only 20% of all the flights that go through DFW will terminate there. 80% will go on through. This, in fact, will give our through customers uh, a better service versus changing airplanes, and it will improve our connections and flow. This has to go on across the entire system as well as DFW. The aircraft productivity can be increased in several ways, and one is through the number of seats, which we have already done. Under the old first-class coach combination, we had 130 seats in the, in, in the dual-class airplane. Now, in the spacious 34 to 35-inch legroom Texas-class configuration, we increased to 146 seats, an increase of 12.3%. Not only do we get more seats, but they're also leather, which the customers like, and the, and the additional leg room is more than any other major carrier has in their coach section. The, most of them are at 31 and 32 inches now. This is going to be hard for some other carriers to match, like American. The only thing they can do is take out some seats. They may claim to have slim line, thin line seats, but uh, until the knees actually can touch the floor without gouging the seat in front of you, slim line seats don't help. It takes some leg room. Or another carrier, I guess, could take out their first class section, which we have done, and try to spread out the rows throughout the airplane. You can also increase your aircraft utilization by flying the airplanes more hours, and we're doing exactly that. This past fall, we were utilizing our aircraft only eight hours a day. And as of February 1, we'll be up to 10 and a half hours a day utilization per aircraft per day for the 727-200 fleet. This increase was gained through better management of our assets and without buying more airplanes. In fact, as I've mentioned before, nine airplanes go on the ground on January 7th, the 727-100 fleet. We're heading for 12 hours a day, 
and it can be done on block-to-block -block utilization. The total increase in February, comparing it to December, we go to 402 departures a day instead of 375, a total increase of about 8% in hours and departures. And that flying to San Francisco is free. The increased productivity coming out of the pilot contract did two things. It allowed us to enter a market and take on American and Delta. It also allowed some pilots to keep working who might otherwise have been furloughed, a benefit to the company that we've got to have across all employee groups. And speaking of that, we are going to have to see an ongoing improvement with all the employee groups. We'll be working in the next, as quick as we can, I don't know what the timetable will, when it will end, but with the Teamsters, the IAM, the flight attendants, the dispatchers, and management must make similar productivities as the pilots did. And I haven't forgotten, even though I'm new here, that all of you took a 10% salary decrease back in March 1981, which continues today. And you were the first in the industry, and I wouldn't want to mislead you. I think that cut will stay in there for quite a while. I don't see any way to get it back. We're not going back to the employee groups asking for further salary cuts. I don't think that's the way you go to improve the morale. You've taken your cut, and it won't be 5% or 6% out of somebody's salary alone that's going to turn this airline around. It's going to take all those spokes in that wheel. But we are going to ask that people hold the line on salaries and hold the line on a lot of other benefits, and in fact, as the pilots did, return some vacation time to us. And we'll be looking at this in management and other groups as well. And finally, we've got to dispose of excess and surplus property and facilities such as this place right here. We have now uh, signed a contract with a commercial realtor to try to find someone or several folks, if necessary, to come in and take over the cost of this building, which is over $600,000 a month. And what we need is some kind of low-budget, empty warehouse, or there's even a lot of space in our own old concourse back at Love Field where we may want to put some of our folks uh, in the next few months. The whole nut of this strategy is that we're looking for inexpensive opportunities to bring revenue in quickly. We don't see major route restructuring in 1982 within the domestic system. We have not had an opportunity to fully examine South America at all, and you won't hear us talking much about South America today. It's not that we're not interested, we just have not at this point had the time to study it and talk about it intelligently. I would say to you, though, I'm concerned about some of the cost structures I see in the various countries and in the flying and in the labor forces in South America. That has to have a very close look. Anyway, folks, all this is going to be necessary if we're going to make the new BRANF be quickly become a low-cost, low-fare, profitable, specialized carrier. Another way of saying that is that BRANF will achieve profitability and a sustainable competitive advantage by establishing ourselves as the low fare, low cost, service intensive airline. And we're going to be talking purpose, purpose, purpose of this company as within the next few weeks with you because it's absolutely essential that we get some goals in place and that people understand what the mission and the goal of this company is. Our purpose is to make a profit. We're not here as missionaries. Now, that takes care of the slides, but I'm just going to leave that one up there for a little bit. I'd like to share with you some of my personal thoughts about managing and a management philosophy, because as you and I move ahead together, you're going to have to forget a lot about what has happened in the past. And I keep having people come up and tell me horror stories. You won't believe what happened when and so. And I've come to the point when I believe them all, because I haven't, I've been surprised too many times. But we're looking ahead. This is the 80s. The competition level is changing. There are new carriers starting up with lower labor costs and lower all kinds of costs. And if we're going to turn this company around, we have to think differently about ourselves and about our customers and about the product that we're putting out. We have to think of them as individuals. When I used to work at United, a great guy named Eddie Carlson always said, you know, you may have been a flight attendant or you may have been a ticket agent and you may have talked to 500 people that day but the next person that comes up, it's opening night for that person because you are the first airline contact they may have had that day. Every passenger is not the same. We may call them the passengers, but each one is an individual and each one has a different expectation level. Translate it to yourselves. Each one of you as a management person or management employee 
has a different expectation level of this company and of yourselves. We went into to Texas class for many reasons, and I hope over time we can convince you that Texas class and single class is better than what we were offering before. Do not look down your noses at the fact that we no longer have a specific first class section. Look at it in the other direction. Everybody on Braniff is getting first class service now. Nobody is second class. Texas class is better than coach. We want it to be that way, in amenities and all. The fares are lower. But what is Texas class? It's not red bandanas and blue jeans and cowboy shirts and boots. Texas class is a way of thinking. It's a business-like approach. It's a friendly approach. It's a professional approach. And the southwest part of this country is the growth part of the country. It's tradition. Jeff Creed and the folks came up with an outstanding idea that on Friday, we're going over to Love Field and we're going to dedicate an airplane to the Dallas Cowboys. And on the tail on either side will be the, the, the silver helmet with the star in it. And up under the nose will be the, the words the Dallas Cowboys. That airplane is Texas. That is tradition. And that's what we want to stand for as we move ahead. Tony Wainwright and the agency have been learning how to apply this, and you'll see it in the advertising. This is not something that's going to go and come. Texas class is many things, but most of all, it's probably you and me. I can't work in an environment where every manager at every level is covering their ass, and I've seen a lot of that at Braniff. And let's get that stopped right now, because if the, for the letters and so forth that have been coming in, and by the way, the survey that, that Ron Ridgway and the folks had put together to go out, and in which Don Beck enhanced by adding a letter for people to write back to me on the open letter, is going crazy. I'm trying to read every one, and there are hundreds. I should have brought the books down for you to see the volume. I would guess we must have at least 1,000 to 1,200 responses for employees. Almost from employees, almost all of them signed, almost all of them extremely constructive and helpful to me. And it'll take me a little while, probably through the holidays, but I'm trying to answer each one with a little handwritten note. And you know, if there's one thing I hear from the employees, that's probably it. I don't get any feedback. I don't get any feedback. I may make a suggestion, people say, I'll go take a look at it. I never see them again. We've got to be responsive. And it starts with me, and I'm trying to be responsive, and I'm going to ask that you be responsive as well. This is a new era for Braniff. It's a new way of thinking about our people. They're adults. You're adults, and you want to be treated like an adult, a mature adult. And our people want to be treated like an adult as well. I hear complaints about rudeness of our people from customers. You heard me use the word that was in that letter, arrogant. Braniff has had that attitude. As, as perceived by the customer. Or as somebody else said, Braniff is an airline that doesn't smile. We've got to smile, starting with me. Turn around to the person next to you and smile and see what happens. Right now, just turn to the person, even Ridgeway, you know, that'll make you laugh. <laughs> see what happens? It's amazing. And when that customer walks up or when you walk through the airport in the morning, if you're like this, you'll set a tone across your work environment that'll last all day long. And I got to answer the damn letters then when they write in. So don't. It's got to be a teamwork thing. Let's take DFW as an example. There are a tremendous number of improvements that John Stifler and the folks are working on over there. They've got to happen quick. I stood over there the other morning as we helped the fellows a little bit load bags and watch the fog go by. And I watched that Docutel system smash about three bags while I was standing there. We can't let that continue. It's costing us money, giving a bad impression, and bad service. We've got to listen. Our employees have input that they want to share. You've got to listen. I spend most of my time, I, I prefer to talk, as all of us do, but it seems like I've been spending most of my time listening as well. We're going to demand high performance standards. There's a tremendous layer of mediocrity in this company which has to go. I'm not sure what caused it. I really don't care. All I can tell you is that from here on, we will keep flattening this structure when we can see opportunities to do so, giving each of you more responsibility and more accountability. I don't want to make all the decisions. I, I, I'm not built that way, and I, I don't believe this company can be run as a one-person show. I'm going to be the head cheerleader, and then I expect each of you to be a cheerleader as well. I don't look like a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. I know that. Most of you don't either, as a matter of fact. 
But we've got to be the cheerleaders that get out there and lead our folks. They are ripe for some leadership, and it starts with you and me. And I hold you accountable, just as the board of directors holds me accountable. Let's stop blaming somebody else. Let's take a team approach, and I started to talk about DFW and interrupted myself. I told Bill Huskins and Ron Ridgway that I think at DFW, the, the maintenance department, the head of maintenance, the head of uh, customer services, and the head of flight, and the head of in-flight, we ought to hold them accountable as a four-person team, or if I've left out a department, I'm sorry, for the total improvement at DFW. I'm tired of hearing whose delay was whose. I don't really care. The customer doesn't really care. We want to see airplanes leave the gate on time. You all go off in a room somewhere else later and critique it, but don't air your dirty laundry back and forth. I'm not going to spend all my time looking back to yesterday to see what the hell went wrong. I got to look at today and look ahead to tomorrow. We can critique yesterday to death, and it looks to me like we've done a lot of that in this company. We got to do some training. It's got to start with us right here. We've got to have some skills training, and that's what Don Beck and John Maurer can help with, with the senior officers. Most of us were put in our jobs like you were. At some time, somebody said, you're now a management person, or you're now a supervisor, act like one. So how do you act like one? We haven't been training, given the training and the skills. We're gonna start doing that. We've gotta be sure that the, the suggestion channels, and I don't mean a suggestion program, heaven forbid we ever have a formal suggestion program in this company. That's more, more work than we can get good out of. What we want is an open communication so that when suggestions come up, you feel free to receive one. And don't sit on it, and don't feel that, God, I can't pass that on. They turned me down before. Stick in the mail and send it up here. Pick up the phone, better yet, and call me or call Ron or Bill, whoever else. We can get rid of a lot of paperwork in this company, I think, if we'll just stop and think, can I make the decision myself? Can I handle the action? Do I have to write a letter? Do I have to copy 14 other people? Think about it before you do it. Maybe tradition, maybe a little of the tradition can be washed away. I guess the 82 Braniff that the public is going to see uh, is us. It's you and me. They're not going to see that individual or that different Braniff that they were used to in the past. I think we're responsible to the public as well and also to some stockholders. And over time, I hope that you and I and all of our employees have a little greater stake in this thing through some stock because I'll tell you, it certainly makes a difference in your attitude about your, uh, about your company. I thought a funny thing happened to me at DFW that day when I put on the coveralls and the cap and I walked down the corridor that morning trying to find the, the door to go downstairs. I couldn't even find my place to go to work. But I thought, here I am dressed as a ramp serviceman Let's see what happens. And a flight attendant walked down the hall and I said, good morning. She looked at me like, who the hell are you? I'm not gonna talk to you. And then I met a pilot and I said, good morning. He didn't speak to me either. You know, we're on this thing together, no matter what uniform you have on. How would you like it if we walked down the hall and I ignored you? You wouldn't. Every person and every job in this company is important. If it's not, then we ought to get rid of it. We ought to treat each other as teammates and as adults as well. Now, if productivity continues, we can do things like I've mentioned on the DFW San Francisco thing, and I think you will find ways in your own stations and your own work environments to improve productivity without us even telling you. Does everybody have to have their own secretary? Does everybody have to have this and this just because somebody else has it? I'm a little concerned, and I know Phil Guthrie is, he's gonna to talk to you about it, about the sense of urgency of cost saving in this company. I worry that as we put back in a San Francisco, people are going to think the pressure's off. As we add schedules and the head count starts to increase, the costs start coming back on. I don't know that we have the right number of people in this company yet. We're going to have to keep striving and striving for more productivity, productivity, productivity. You're going to get so sick of that word, either that or it's the productivity is going to be so high, we'll, we'll never have to use it again. I have admired the, the tenacity of the Branis family. You have stuck together through some awfully tough times, and I admire that. And Phil and I came here to try to help to put this company in the position that it belongs. I like to have pride in what I do. I like to go to the grocery store and have people say, where do you work? And I'm proud to tell them, I work for Brandt. When I was at Southwest Airlines, I had checks made up that had Southwest airplanes on it. 
and maybe we do that here. I just haven't had time to look yet. But I liked it when I went to the grocery store or wherever, and they said, oh, you work for Southwest? Damn right I do. And we're making a contribution to your community, and I'm spending money in your store. And I'm wearing my brand of pin. John Casey gave me mine the first day. He didn't figure I was going to last 90, so he gave it to us early. <laughs> but this group has a lot of pride, and I hope that you and I together can make that pride grow and grow. I didn't come here to stay a short time, nor did Phil come here. We put our lives and our, our careers on the line to try to help turn this thing around. And I know I can count on you to work with us. Thank you. Here's a guy that I have really enjoyed knowing in a short time, and he comes from a, I mentioned he used to work with Don Nyrop at Northwest Airlines, who is a fellow that I have a tremendous amount of respect for, Bill Huskins, Executive Vice Chief of, VP of Operations. Wait. Thank you, Howard. To establish the operating plan for 1982, it is necessary to begin with an operating schedule. Shortly after Howard Putnam took over the reins of Braniff, he created a scheduled policy group made up of himself, John Casey, Phil Guthrie of Finance, Ron Ridge Ridgeway of Customer Service, Jeff Creed of Sales, Sam Coates, Public Relations, Tony Wainwright of the Bloom Advertising Agency, and myself. The purpose of this committee was to sort out the fundamental factors relating to the airline's development and to relate those to the published schedules, which in turn provides direction to marketing efforts and the entire operational side of the airline to carry out those scheduled objectives. The scheduled policy group now meets regularly and has a had a number of meetings which led to decisions pertaining to increasing the utilization of our 727 aircraft to offset the reduction in aircraft units brought about by the termination of our 727-100 services, the decision to reestablish ourselves as a principal carrier in the Central Plains area of the United States, and, most recently, the decision to re-enter the Dallas-Fort Worth to San Francisco market. The schedule policy group will shortly be reviewing scheduling alternatives, which could become effective on April 25 or in June of 1982. A second committee is being established, which is to be called the Schedule Implementation Committee, and will be chaired by Dave Cummings. You'll hear from Dave in a minute. The committee will be made up of representatives of the various operating functions, some of which may be combined and handled by a single representative, but nevertheless, all operating functions will be represented. The function of the implementation group will be to resolve the many details of flight segment times, turnarounds, station times, connecting traffic problems, and other features that go to make up the final schedule. It will provide a vehicle for making the operating functions aware of the compromises made in each other's area to make a workable, saleable schedule. It will also provide the fastest means to disseminate that information to the stations and crew scheduling, the implementers. Another very necessary ingredient in our operating plan for 1982 will be to produce reliability in our on-time performance so that our customers can achieve what they have every right to expect in the way of getting to their destination when they expect to be there. We shorten ground times and reduce connecting flight time uh, allowances. We must face some new challenges to our planning and coordination. Ron Ridgeway, Vice President of Customer Service, will discuss the ramifications of these requirements with you. Ron. Thank you, Bill. I didn't bring any slides with me, so we're going to do a cheerlead. Uh, are you ready? Uh, several people, uh, starting with uh, Howard, have mentioned our role, and I think uh, in the customer services group, uh, we are indeed cheerleaders. Uh, we do have to smile. We do have to manage by example. And the item that Bill referred to, uh, and I do want you to take me seriously, is the new role that each station and all of the uh, what I like to refer to as the brain power 
in each station will now play with the total reorganization of the OCC function. In my uh, time at Braniff, each of you and I, myself, have had the luxury of letting OCC make the decisions or using OCC as a bouncing uh, board to make sure that we had made the right decision. But a lot of times we dumped a lot of things on the OCC people that should have and could have been done at the station level. But there is a thought that I would uh, uh, leave you with a challenge that uh, many of the old customer services group have heard me say at least a couple of times, but general pressure relentlessly applied. Uh, hopefully I'll help have them remember it and those new to the group uh, think about it. It gives you a lot of food for thought. And I, I'm quoting from a gentleman by the name of Machiavelli who lived in the period 1469 to 1527, and the book is called The Prince. There is nothing more difficult to manage, more dubious to accomplish, or more dangerous to execute than the introduction of new institutions. For the innovate, innovator makes enemies of everyone who is well off under the old order and has unenthusiastic supporters among those who would be well off in the new order. The lack of enthusiasm comes partly from fear of one's opponents, who have the power on their side, and partly from men's skepticism about the legitimacy of innovations until they see them tested by experience. Hence, whenever the opponents of innovation have the opportunity to attack, they do so fanatically, and the supporters defend unenthusiastically. And my challenge to you is use your brain power and let's move forward with the changes uh, those of you who are not comfortable with them yet, yeah, you're going to find by actual results that they are indeed the best way to go at this point in time. Thank you. <laughs> Philip Guthrie, our Executive Vice President of Finance, is next. Philip. Ron, thank you. Somewhere in that comment about uh, fanatic attacks by skeptical institutions. I think there's something about our lender group, but I'm not sure. Um, today we want to share with you some of the items of progress in the financial area. Uh, we will look at some portions of information we've shared with the lender group, some of the financial strategies associated with Braniff's future, and we'll attempt to answer some of the questions that people continue to raise about our business strategy. There is a problem in terms of sharing with you complete information as we have with our lenders because of securities regulations. We will, however, go into as much detail as we possibly can. During the course of 1981, Branham's fleet will have evolved from a total number of 97 aircraft to 84 aircraft by year end. Our fleet strategy is to standardize the fleet through reduction to minimal fleet types. This, coupled with a reduction in the average age of the fleet, will yield cost improvements in a number of areas. As you can see from this slide, the fleet by the end of next year will be down to 71 aircraft from its peak of 116 in 1979. Average fleet age has stayed relatively constant. However, it's most significant to note the average age of the 727-200s, which comprise our domestic fleet. It's only four years. This gives us an opportunity to support high utilization levels without a material decrease in reliability or on-time performance. To our knowledge, this is the youngest major jet fleet in the world. We plan to utilize the fleet as reflected in ASMs to generate a level of operations next year slightly above that of 1978, but we'll do it with 32 fewer aircraft. The theme and pattern throughout our discussions with the lenders has been that the dramatic, rapid expansions begun in late 1978 and the following contractions are now beginning to stabilize. It's important to note that in operations, revenues, and most operating costs, the company is beginning to approach a stable base and some overall equilibrium. 
the cost and revenue mismatches of the last several years will continue into 1982, but they will markedly diminish or disappear throughout the year. As Howard mentioned earlier, perhaps our sense is that the progress in reshaping the cost structure is not going so quickly as our reshaping the fleet and reducing uh, schedules over the past several years. We must absolutely maintain a sense of urgency. We must look for savings opportunities. The group that can find those savings opportunities are in the room today. Learn the new strategy, adjust to it, think differently how the dollars are spent. Another, another decision we would like to share with you concerns the elimination of first class service. This slide outlines the expenses and revenue from first class service since 1977. As you can see, expenses clearly exceeded revenues. In fact, first class service had a 33% negative operating margin since 1977. In other words, we were losing 50 cents for every dollar of first class revenue we generated. Again, a clear cut not entirely popular, but a clear-cut financial decision. We've indicated that our objective is to provide low-cost air transportation to the public. We've also indicated that it's necessary to establish a new cost structure in order to ensure profitability at the new fare levels. This chart indicates Braniff's historic and projected cost performance in generating available seat miles versus our primary competitors, American and Delta. It's noteworthy that in the 1977-78 pre-expansion period, Braniff was able to produce an available seat mile at approximately 12% less than American. The expansion of 1979 and 1980 reversed the historic trend, and it was not until the second quarter of 1981 that Braniff once again produced an ASM at a lower cost than American. A further review indicates that Braniff's cost per ASM, which peaked in the first quarter of 1981, is expected to decline to 8.03 cents during the fourth quarter of this year. We will once again be approximately 10% below the level of American. There continues much to be done to further reduce the cost but certainly the correct trend line is established. We strongly believe that the deteriorating levels of air traffic are attributable only slightly to FAA flight reductions and to general economic conditions. Rather, we believe that over the recent years, the trunk portion of the airline industry has moved up the demand curve so significantly in price that air travel is beyond the reach of many Americans. We believe the success of the fare reduction program will be attributable to generating new traffic from those people who could not afford to fly before, as well as more frequent trips by the business traveler. The type of market stimulation is characteristic of new entrants and low-cost regional carriers. We believe similar results can be achieved on longer haul routes and that Braniff can be the first major airline to accomplish this. It's also important that every, everyone realize we are talking about the generation of traffic. We are not talking about a predatory, transitory effort that must succeed or fail on the basis of movement of traffic from other carriers. It's very clear that in the long term, Braniff must become a different type of airline. We are taking the first step to generate increased revenue with the introduction of Texas class. The second step is in progress and is associated with substantial reductions in the cost of generating available seat miles. The program of reducing unit cost will begin to make Braniff look less and less like a typical trunk carrier. We are not and we cannot continue to think like a trunk carrier. We'll continue to use the same equipment, facilities, and employees. However, we will use markedly different levels of productivity and utilization. The cost structure must be reshaped. We believe that the reductions in unit costs that we're talking about 
can be achieved principally through improving the utilization of our resources rather than substantially reducing the overall expense level. This chart details our expected reductions in available seat miles from a fourth quarter 1981 base. The chart begins with the estimated fourth quarter cost per ASM of 8.03 cents. The first step in the cost reduction is to increase the seating density from the current average of 138.2 seats to the new Texas class level. This generates an ASM cost of 7.68 cents. We expect to achieve aggregate cost and labor productivity savings in excess of $50 million a year. These cost and labor savings will move our ASM costs from 7.68 to 7.35. The next reduction in unit cost shows 8, 10, and 12 hours a day of aircraft utilization. At a 12-hour utilization of a 727-200, we have reduced our unit cost to 6.94 cents, well below the current levels for Braniff and we think significantly below the cost levels of our competitors who average approximately 8.3 cents. We believe this transformation of Braniff into a relatively low cost operator does produce the opportunity for long-term financial viability and provides a roadmap by which our lenders can see a return to profitability. Yesterday we met with all of the company's lenders. A number of questions have arisen as a result of that meeting as to just where are we with the lenders. We'll share that information. Also, we yesterday spent a number of hours with the lenders discussing the 1982 financial plan and where in fact the company is in the process of developing a financial restructuring. Our objective in developing the 1982 financial plan was to develop a most reasonable case presentation. We represented to them what our best judgment of 1982 was. We felt it was important to present a most reasonable and somewhat conservative view. External consultants, independent of Braniff, had been retained to also assess the financial future of Braniff. They have concurred that there is a profitable airline here and that the restructuring efforts in the operating areas of the company are entirely appropriate. In presenting the plan to the lenders, we stress strongly that it was in the lenders and Braniff's best interest to present a rational financial plan against which progress in returning the company to profitability can be measured. Our lenders are not accustomed to see projections which are subsequently met by actual results. But if we are to have a long-term prospect for survival, we can and must achieve the 1982 plan month by month beginning in January. The methodology used in developing the 82 plan was somewhat different from that used in the past. We relied on historical data from existing planning and financial systems. However, in the revenue area, ranges of forecast were developed, assuming different levels of traffic stimulation or elasticity generated by the Texas class fare structure. A greater shortcoming in the existing financial planning system was noted on the cost side. Candidly, the existing financial planning system and the budgeting system is essentially a method of defending the status quo. Clearly, this approach was highly inappropriate for the structural cost changes which are being and must continue to be implemented in 1982. For these reasons, the financial plan was developed with a top-down perspective of not only where management expects the company to be, but also the level of cash generation and profitability which the company must achieve if it is to survive. There are many individual components in the plan which can and will shift up and down. But we as management must concentrate on achieving and striving to beat the operating income levels 
we have shared with the lenders. We will be working with each of you in the various functional areas to establish goals and objectives which are measurable month by month to be sure that we're all working consistently to achieve the plan. Of particular interest is a look at employee productivity. This slide indicates that since 1979, Braniff's productivity per employee as measured by ASMs or RPMs declined when compared to prior years. In 1982, we anticipate returning to the trend line. When viewed from the perspective of 1979 and prior years, the company is not going into uncharted ground in terms of productivity. Rather, we're moving closer to a historical level and then achieving reasonable improvements from there. The current status with our lenders is that we're working with them to resolve the February 1 deadline. We will also be developing a calendar for a long-term financial restructuring of the company. We have shared with them the criticality of resolving the financial problem, and we can report that they are generally in agreement and positive. But we are in the midst of a complex financial and legal negotiation. We expect, though, that the current issues can be resolved. At this point, I think our view is that the lender group is extremely sensitive to uh, this particular topic and that they will work to resolve the February 1 deadline in a reasonably expeditious manner. Probably not as quickly as we would like, but it should be done reasonably quickly. In summary, we have a financial plan which, it, which will bring Braniff within sight of being a reconstituted, redesigned airline. We're concentrating on a well-defined market niche, which offers the highest possibility of stability and ultimate profitability. We believe the objective of establishing Texas-class service and repositioning Braniff is the most attractive, realistic alternative, and even more, it is the only alternative. We want to carve out that niche in a deregulated airline industry, somewhere between the larger high-cost trunk carriers and the small regional carriers. The principal elements needed to restore profitability are a return to basics, a stress on efficiency, and a rational root structure. Only time and management concentration are required to accomplish these changes now. We do have a solution to resolving our problems, both internally and with our lenders. I think it's very important that every individual in management concentrate on assuring that their area is as cost effective as humanly possible. Our lenders are looking for this result before a long-term financial restructuring and survival is possible, and I believe we can deliver that. Thank you. If Sam Coates were here, he'd say that we're going to have a lean, mean, flying machine. With that, I'd like to present Mr. Tony Wainwright, the Chairman and CEO of the Bloom Agency. Tony. Thank you, Howard. Uh, as, as Howard mentioned, the past few weeks, we've been working uh, to bring Texas class to life. Uh, even though I'm standing up here, uh, I am representative of about 75 people who worked on what you're about to see uh, and worked uh, uh, long, long hours and weekends and, and so on to put all this together. When we approached it, uh, <laughs> what we have strived to do is to provide a compelling message that we believe will attract more passengers, but with particular emphasis on the heavy traveler, the business traveler. We've done this in a way that we think will enable us to use less media dollars and to have more impact. 
Now, we all know that the airline industry is changing dramatically and the route structures are, are being altered, and that many airlines' fares are so complex and so riddled with restrictions and limitations that not even seasoned travel agents can easily understand them. So the result is a lot of confusion and a great many problems. But the last thing that any passenger wants when they fly are problems. What they want is privacy. They want comfort. They want a chance to work or to rest. They want to sit back and relax and enjoy themselves. People want on-time flights, on-board luggage. And when they land, they want to be in a good frame of mind to start their business day. In short, they want things their way. And Braniff is going to do just that. We'll be going their way by offering them more for less. That will be Texas class. It'll be a brand new way to fly with one-stop check-ins so they don't have to stand in line. Advanced seat selection. And once on board, they'll find soft leather Texas size seats with inches more leg room than they get on other airlines. Texas class also means the Braniff will be going their way by putting a newspaper on the seat. If they get thirsty, they'll get two drinks for the price of one. And on morning flights, breakfast will be going their way with a big Texas class meal. All of this will focus on this important traveler, the business traveler. Yes, Braniff's new Texas class service is going to work because we'll be going your way with that friendly, open Texas hospitality that's known around the world on that can-do, will-do philosophy that comes naturally to a land where the impossible happens every day. Texas class is going to work because of the proud people at Braniff, all of you, who personify the best of Texas class and Texas style. And it's because of all of you that Braniff is going your way. Braniff is going your way when you're going home. Braniff is going your way when you're going home. For work or for play, we're going your way, so you won't have to go it alone. Braniff is going your way more than ever. the beginning. Braniff is going your way with lower fares and more comfort and Texas class. All the things that make flying more enjoyable to our passengers. You'll see it on our planes, you'll see it on our counters, and you'll see it in the advertising. Most of all, you'll see it in the pride and determination of Braniff itself. Put that together and you can be sure that Braniff is going to go all the way because we're going your way. Braniff is going your way when you're going home. For work or for play, we're going your way, so you won't have to go it alone. Braniff is going your way more than ever today. Play, we're going your way 
With our Texas class that you can afford We make it easy Renovate is going your way More than ever today You won't believe how Renovate Renovate is going your way Each and every day So what do you say? We're going your way With the spirit that's growing strong Places that they've never been Brennan is going your way More than ever today It's never been more fun Brennan Brennan is going your way If you need to travel on business Brennan is going your way with Texas Class, a brand new way to fly. Soft leather Texas size seats, more leg room, steak and eggs for breakfast, your own newspaper, and two drinks for the price of one. All for the lowest everyday fares, with absolutely no restrictions to ever get in your way. Brand is going your way. So come on, let Braniff's Texas Class take you to New York or LA for just $135. And you can enjoy all the comfort and hospitality of Braniff's Texas Class to Houston or Midland, Odessa for just $39 any weekday, $24 evenings and weekends. That's Texas Class, and it's the only way to fly. Braniff! for 82. Thank you. I think they like it too, Tony. Well, that's our story, folks. Uh, you've seen the plan. It's our new airline. We think it's exciting, and I hope you do. But I guess the message is that all the restructuring, all the Texas class, all the advertising, all the whistles and bells won't do it unless you and I and our people are committed to make this thing work. They've got to be imbued with the same spirit that you feel today. And now you got to go home and implement it and start talking to your people and telling them about it and involving them because the responsibility is now yours and mine to make this thing work, and they've got to do it with us. Are you with me? <laughs>